Anthony Marr is a graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop and is currently a Stegner Fellow at Stanford University. He's the winner of a Pushcart Prize, the Atlantic Student Writing Contest, and the Narrative Prize. His essay, The Palace of the People, was included in the Best American Non-Required Reading in 2012. Like most of my fellow booksellers, I'm often asked, what are you reading? What are you really excited about? And for the past seven months, I've been telling people, the book you have to read is this great first novel about survivors in the Chechen Wars. It'll blow you away, but it's not coming out until May. <laughs> well, it's finally here, and what a delight to finally be able to put the book in readers' hands. And telling the story of Hava, a young girl orphaned by war, Ahmed, a man determined to bring her to safety, and Sonia, a doctor working in the ruins of a bombed out hospital, Anthony Mara deeply humanizes the bitter conflict in Chechnya. In the hands of a gifted storyteller, a novel can get closer to the truth of an experience than other genres. In the hands of a gifted storyteller, the absurdities and horrors of war wrestle with the love, warmth, and humor of life. The characters that Anthony's created in a constellation of vital phenomena are real and unforgettable. The landscape where they live is vivid and tangible. It's an honor to be able to share this remarkable book with you, our readers, so please help me welcome Anthony Marr. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction, and I see many familiar faces here, so thank you all very much for, for coming out. Um, I have come to politics and prose since I was a little kid. I grew up um, a few blocks away from here, and I would I would come to events here, and I would sit in the audience. My um, my uh, sophomore high school teacher is here, and he he sent me here to to an event and to, to do a report on it. And to be standing on the other side of the podium um, is really just an honor. Um, and uh, I've I've always come to politics and prose um, because it has always felt like um, part of any visit home, that, that it's part of, of coming home is coming here. And um, it hasn't really been until I've been through this publication process that I've come to understand how important independent bookstores like politics and prose are to getting uh, serious novels noticed and, and uh, the, the, the kinds of books that, that um, people will be reading in 10 and 20 years are the kinds of books that find their readership today thanks to, to stories like this. So. Um, my thanks to them as, as a reader as well as a writer tonight. Um, my book, as, as was mentioned, is, is about Chechnya. Um, the most common question I've, I've gotten is, why Chechnya? And it's, uh, it's a region that has come into the news recently. It's, um, it's set in the Northern Caucasus Mountains, which is a chain that runs through Russia's southwestern corner between the Black and Caspian Sea. The, um, the capital is Grozny, not Prague, and um, and it's it's a place that I became interested in when I was uh, when I was in college. I studied in Saint Petersburg, Perg, uh, Russia, and I arrived a couple of months after the Russian journalist Anna Politkovskaya was assassinated for her reporting from Chechnya, and uh, in a in a metro station near my apartment, Russian veterans of of the Chechen wars came and. Um, and congregated there. And it was a place that was just very much in the ether at the time. Um, but I knew nothing about it. I didn't know where it was on a map, how to spell it. And so I began reading about it. And um, I, I was really immediately struck by the kinds of, of stories of ordinary people persisting in extraordinary circumstances and retaining their humanity despite all of these historical forces that were um, determined to, to strip them of it. And they were stories that seemed to demand to be illuminated through fiction. Um, but for all the searching I did for a novel set in Chechnya, I couldn't find one. And so I came to this book more as, as a writer, excuse me, a reader than a writer. It was a book I wanted to, to find on a shelf, but it wasn't there yet. And um, uh, most, most people who, uh, who have heard about Chechnya um, over the past two decades, it's been because of the Chechen Wars. Um, and, and various um, atrocities and tragedies that have happened there. But there is also this other side, um, the stories of, of what people have done in order to survive. Um, I had the opportunity to visit Chechnya, and when I was there, I, I went to uh, the Tolstoy Museum. Tolstoy um, came to Chechnya to a, a town in, in the northern uh, Caucasus Plains called uh, Starogladovskaya, and he arrived in 
in 1851 um, to escape some gambling debts he had accrued in Moscow. <laughs> and he came there, and it was, he spent uh, around three years there, and it was there that he began writing his first novel, Childhood. And uh, he returned to that area in fiction for his last book, Haji Murad. And uh, I, I visited this museum. It, it was the only museum to stay open throughout the Chechen Wars, thanks to its proprietor, who guarded it by shotgun um, from Russian soldiers and Chechen rebels. And uh, it might seem peculiar that um, in a war in which Russia was, was invading Chechnya, that a Chechen family would risk their lives in order to preserve the legacy of the quintessential Russian novelist. And um, so I, I went to this museum, and um, I was expecting sort of, you know, Tolstoy's pen, some manuscripts. But, uh, but when you walk in, there's, uh, there's nothing there. There's drapes on the walls, um, but other than that, it's completely empty. Um, and this, this proprietor, a man named Salavdi, will take you from room to room to room, and he'll just tell you stories about, about Tolstoy's life, about his works. And um, while I was there, I realized that that this place has no historical significance whatsoever. There's no, <laughs> there's no artifact there. There's, there's no evidence that Tolstoy ever stepped foot on this, this parcel of land. Um, and yet it was a place that, that this family risked their life uh, to preserve because it was a place, um, it, was a, it was a safe place for stories to flourish. And by saving these, these stories, they were able to, to save themselves. Um, and so this, this novel is, is a constellation of vital phenomena, comes um, from that side of, of the Chechen Wars. Um, it's, it's very much of that world. Uh, and it, uh, it begins on a snowy night in 2004 when a, um, a man named Ahmed watches as his next door neighbor um, is abducted by Russian soldiers. Um, under suspicions that he's abetting the Chechen rebels. And Ahmed uh, finds his neighbor's eight-year-old daughter, a girl named Hava, um, in the forest later that evening. And he takes her to the only safe place he can think of, which is a hospital in the nearest city. This hospital is run by a surgeon named Sonia. And so Sonia was educated in London, and she returned to Chechnya in order to search for her missing sister. And at first, she's unwilling to take in this girl, but, um, but uh, gradually she, she agrees to so long as Ahmed returns every day to help her run this hospital. And this, this family and the, um, the unusual family they become really stays Can at... Can you at, come a little closer to the mic? Sure. It's off to the side, so it's important. Yeah, is that better? Yeah. Um, this, the, these three, uh, three sort of castaways and the unusual family they become really stay at, at the forefront of the book, even as it, it expands to include other characters. Um, for instance, there's a character named Kassan, who is a historian, and he is, has spent his career writing this epic 3,000-page um, history of Chechnya. And every time he gets close to completing it, a shift in the prevailing political winds in Moscow requires him to go back to the beginning and rewrite it to conform with the prevailing uh, political ideology. Um, oh. I very much felt like that while I was writing this. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, so there's sort of a, a wide cast of characters, and it, it, the novel moves around in time um, quite a bit. There are, are uh, a number of, of different storylines, and it shifts through time. Um, war breaks things. It breaks families. It breaks buildings. Uh, it even breaks stories in time. And all of these characters are, um, in their own way, trying to recover um, what has been lost. And so as they each uh, individually um, go about trying to piece their own pasts together, the novel at an architectural level is mending their stories into a communal whole. Um, the, the title is a bit of a handful, A Constellation of Vital Phenomena, um, but it's written right on the spine, so I'm not going to forget it. Um, <laughs> But it's, it's, uh, it's actually taken from the uh, medical dictionary definition of life. There are, um, there are six vital phenomena, organization, irritability, adaptation, reproduction, growth, and movement. And it's the constellation, the confluence, the, the overlapping and integration of these six phenomena that allows life to emerge at its most basic uh, microbial level. And as, as life is structured as a constellation of these six phenomena, uh, the novel is structured as a constellation of six point-of-view characters. Um, and so that's uh, a little bit of background about, about the book. 
Um, I'm going to, to read a, a little section here. Um, it is set in 1996, and uh, it's, it's when a character named Sonia, who is, is this, uh, this surgeon who's single-handedly running this, this hospital, um, she has just finished up, uh, she, she's been in, in London um, at a, a residency there, and she's returned to Chechnya after the, the first Chechen war has ended um, in order to search for her missing sister. So this is a few pages from that section. Within days after the proposal of the Kasav Yurt peace accord, Sonia broke up with her Scottish fiance, resigned from her residency at the University College Hospital, and sat through connecting flights from London to Warsaw to Moscow to Vladikavkaz. The back seat of the gypsy cab she took from the airport had been removed to allow room for her luggage, and her single suitcase slid with the curvature of the road, thudding again and again against the back of her seat, as if to reiterate the lesson that despite the illusions she'd entertained while Brendan's chest rose and receded against hers, her life was small enough to fit inside a piece of luggage. Fuck me, she thought. What am I doing back here? Dark plumes drifted from distant smokestacks, a chain of wind-rounded mountains, the taste of post-Soviet air like a dirty rag in her mouth. When they reached the bus terminal, she waited until her roller suitcase was safely on the ground before paying the driver. The Samsonite, a final gift from Brendan, might as well have been a neon-lit billboard advertising her foreignness as she rolled it past the Imperial-era steamer trunks of other travelers. The nationalized bus line no longer ran routes into Chechnya, but after she had waited for an hour in a three-person line, a clerk directed her to a kiosk that sold lesbian porn, Ukrainian cigarettes, air supply cassettes, and tickets on a privately owned bus that made a weekly journey from North Ossetia to Chechnya. The next departure wasn't until the following morning. Though tired from travel, she knew she wouldn't sleep. She sat through the night on a wooden bench with one of her shoelaces tied around the suitcase to discourage gypsy children from rolling off with it. I'm driving you all to your graves, the bus driver announced as he walked down the aisle to collect tickets at a quarter past six in the morning. He leaned back as though balancing an invisible shot glass on his round stomach. If given the opportunity, I will sell you all to the first bandit, kidnapper, or slave traver we come across. Don't say you haven't been warned. I wouldn't have to drive this bus to that country if you hadn't purchased these tickets. And for that, I will drive over every pothole and divot to make the ride <laughs> as miserable for you as it will be for me. And no, we will be not making any bathroom breaks. And yes, it's because I know the pain a pothole causes a full bladder. <laughs> she dozed for an hour with her head resting against the window. Every bump in the road was transferred through the glass and recorded by her temple. The sharp pitch of brakes followed by the bullhorn amplified instructions of a Russian border guard brought her back to sudden consciousness. The soldiers were all fear and peach fuzz. They ordered the passengers off the bus and demanded each open his or her luggage in a field 20 meters from the road while they, the waiting soldiers, crouched with their arms wrapped around their legs and their eyes clamped tight as if jumping into a lake. The poor driver swayed from side to side. Since he was a boy living on the banks of the Tarek, he had dreamed of owning his own tour boat. Six and three quarter years earlier, just a week before the Berlin Wall fell, the driver had sunk his life savings into a tour boat, never built, and a contract, never fulfilled, to ferry party members along the Tarek. Now he sat on the ground and rested his back against the tires of the bus, but the land was a swelling and uncertain ocean, and he would feel seasick for many years. The checkpoint left Sonia charged, and as they crossed from Russian-controlled North Ossetia into Chechnya, she stared through the window she had slept on. On the crater-consumed road, the driver made good on his pledge. They passed deserted fields, a toppled farmhouse, a plow resting at the end of the furrow, four months past sowing season. At the horizon, the mountains wore skull caps of snow. It took 10 hours to drive the, the 200 kilometers to Volchansk. Checkpoints dotted the highway more regularly than the boarded petrol stations. At each one, she carried her suitcase 20 meters from the road, 
and opened it as soldiers held their ears in anticipation. She spoke to the elderly woman sitting beside her, rolling each word in her mouth like an olive pit before spitting it out. And the woman was a wonderful listener, quiet and attentive, as Sonia unfastened the latch to what had been her life until two days prior. She cataloged Brendan's shortcomings, his unclipped hangnails, his, habits, his habit of singing Rodgers and Hammerstein while peeing, his reluctance to correct her grammatical errors. But even as she tried to convince the old woman that Brendan would have made a lousy husband, she missed the way he would write his initials in the pad of her, in the pad of her thumb with his hardened hangnails, the way the toilet water accompanied the hills are alive with the sound of music, the intentional grammatical mistakes he would make to see if she would catch them as they took a sledgehammer to the rules of English and reassembled the pieces into a language only they understood. It was wonderful to unburden herself to a sympathetic ear. An hour passed before the old woman pulled a notepad from her purse, scribbled on it, and passed it to Sonia. I thought you would have realized, the old woman had written, I'm deaf. <laughs> The four-story Volchansk terminal was now a one-story rubble heap. The bus driver held out his, tat, his hat for tips as they disembarked. You will all die in this hellscape, he cheerfully announced. Would you rather your rubles go to your godless murderers or to me, an honest and pious bus driver who braves death each week to provide for his family? Against her better judgment, Sonia dropped a hyperinflated thousand-ruble note into the hat and climbed down before he could curse her. At the next block, she caught up with the old woman who had flagged down a lemon-colored lada. The old woman had grown up on a lemon orchard, and for her first 17 years, she hadn't eaten a single meal that wasn't made of lemon. There had been lemon cucumber salad, lemon vinaigrette beans, lemon glazed chicken, lemon stuffed trout, lemon lamb kebab, lemon dill rice, lemon roast chicken thighs, lemon curd dressing, lemon pudding, lemon apricot cake, lemon marmalade cookies, and on and on it went. She was still four years and one month from her 76th birthday and the miracle of her first lime. And <laughs> so this, uh, this section is, is, is her um, coming into to, to Chechnya um, after being in, in London for um, a number of years. And um, when we think of, of images of Chechnya that we see on the news, it tends to be sort of this, uh, you know, sort of Stalingrad circa 19... 43 ruins, um, and I, I had the opportunity to visit Chechnya um, a year ago, um, sort of as a, a fact-checking trip uh, for, for the book, and uh, it's been utterly transformed today. You go to Grozny, and um, everything is exactly five years old. Um, the, the, there's no, there's no, um, no dirt on the mortar between bricks. Um, th there are several skyscrapers, um, and you get the sense that, that it's just the, uh, the ruins of of ha haven't been rebuilt so much as this new city has been transplanted and, and plopped on top of, of the wreckage of its predecessor. Um, and despite all that, uh, the, the people I met there, there, there definitely is this, this sense of, of everything in the present is, is only, um, can only be qualified and, and judged in relation to, to the recent, uh, recent past. So one, uh, one morning I was waiting outside of, of my hotel for my ride and um, a guy came up to me, and he uh, he didn't have a beard. He was wearing a t-shirt and um, and track track pants, and looked like he could have been been a frat boy at, at a, a Big Ten school. Um, and he asked me, "Are you a CIA spy?" <laughs> um, and I said, "No, I'm not a CIA spy, but chances are a CIA spy when when." tell you that he was a CIA spy. And he sort of nodded knowingly and said, you are a CIA spy. <laughs> um, and we, after I convinced him that, that I, wasn't, I was not, in fact, a, a spy, um, we started talking. And, and I was asking him about um, what it was like to live in, in Chechnya today versus, versus a couple years ago. Um, and he said, and, and everything he said was, was one of these um, uh, comparisons to, to, to the recent past. Um, five years ago, he couldn't walk outside after four or five in the evening, and today he could walk around all night if he wanted to. Five years ago, he didn't have a job, and now he got to lift weights for a living, and wasn't that wonderful. Um, and at one point, he, uh, he, he looked at me and he said, um, I wonder what it would be like to live in a country where um, you can say what you think. And then he sort of smiled and said, but why would I need to do that when everything's perfect? Um, <laughs> And, 
and people, the, the people I met there um, often found ways to um, found ways to retain their humanity, to endure through these um, these difficult times. Um, there was there was a, a man I met uh, named Adam who had um, recreated in his backyard a um, a replica of his childhood village. Um, and he, he would go to the mountains and quarry stone himself and build it into these multi-story towers. And he would dig irrigation canals. And it was really this entire lost world that he spent the war years building. Um, and for, for this character, Sonia, uh, she sort of has a similar experience uh, in, uh, in this hospital. She ends up um, uh, joining the, the skeleton staff of, of this hospital where her training is is vital and necessary in a way that it never could be in London and gives her this new sense of purpose. Um, so I will just read uh, two more pages and then and then open it up for questions. Days turn to weeks. Uh, and, and I should uh, point out that this is after she's she's been asking people where, where her sister is and, and if there's any information about her sister. Days turned to weeks, and Sonia accosted the few remaining tenants as they left for work, battle, or better shelter. But she never received more than a shake of the head, a shrug of the shoulders, an apology. There was, there was no sign of forced entry, and the made bed in Natasha's room suggested a deliberate departure. In the bottom dresser drawer, Sonia found the burgundy cardigan she'd given Natasha for her 18th birthday the one Natasha hated and called a babushka sweater, and never wore, not even once on a chilly day, to appease Sonia. It was just what Natasha would leave behind. She held that sweater, wrapping the arms over her shoulders as if in an embrace. Hospital number six hired her without requesting an application or resume. When she provided a list of references in London, Nurse Deshi crumpled the paper, tossed it under the desk, and told Sonia that Dr. Wastebasket would dutifully contact each recommender. <laughs> Sonia's former professors had fled to the west, to the countryside, to private practices in places where they could save lives without endangering their own. Unimpeded by hierarchical bureaucracy or institutional memory, she rose from resident to head surgeon in two months. Landmines didn't obey the peace accord, and within a year she had more trauma surgery experience than the professors she studied under. She worked with gratitude for the pain of her patients. In their cries, she heard her name as though she were the missing sister, recalled by their gibberish to this place where she amputated limbs and staunched bleeding. Where her training was so needed and scarce, her patients saw her hovering over the hospital bed as the last prophet of life whom they pleaded with and praised and spoke to in prayer. The days were urgent, without pause for reflection beyond the recall of case studies and anatomy lessons. At night, she drifted home. If she remembered, she would brush her teeth with baking soda and recite the prayers her mother had taught her. Her tongue fumbled with those awkward and ancient words, and though no one was listening, she found a measure of peace in this obsolete language of supplication. After crossing herself, she lay against the divan and squirted a cool puddle of hand lotion, the kind she brought back from London. Invariably, she would apply too much, and her hands would be slick and shiny in the candlelight as she asked for another pair with which to share the excess. The weeks stacked into months that were flipped from the Red Cross calendar hanging beyond, behind the waiting room reception desk. The calendar was from 1993, and it would be reused until 2006, and for those 13 years, her birthday would always fall on a Monday. She marked the days, but time didn't march forward. Instead, it turned from day to night, from hospital to flat, from cries to silence, from claustrophobia to loneliness, and back again, like a coin flipping from side to side. Happiness came in moments of unpredictable loveliness. The blind man who played accordion for her as she splinted the broken leg of his guide dog. The boy who narrated his dreams while recovering from meningitis. Then, one evening, a knock sounded from the door as she prepared for sleep. She considered and disregarded Lena's advice as the doorknob slipped in her greasy grip. When she opened the door, she wanted to scream. Natasha stood right there, in front of her, close enough to hold. She did scream, and she embraced Natasha, and later on, on the divan, she took Natasha's hand in her own and rubbed until hers were dry. 
um, and I'm uh, delighted to take any questions now. The title, um, originally the story was written as, as a short story. Um, it was about 25 pages. And um, there were uh, sort of fewer characters, um, a much different story. Um, but it, it sort of provided a skeleton for the book while I wrote. Um, and in that story, I, I had come across this definition of life. I, I found myself, as one often does, flipping through medical dictionaries, looking, looking uh, <laughs> up definitions. Um, and, and I looked up the definition of a foot, you know, of, of an elbow, and, and uh, uh, eventually I got to the L section and, and found life. Um, and I was really, uh, there, there are several other definitions, but I was kind of um, taken by, by, by this one, a constellation of vital phenomena. It just sounded too... Um, too sort of odd uh, and unmedical in a way. It's a, a, a little poetic, but a little clunky. Um, and um, and so I put it in this in this short story. And um, uh, a friend of mine um, read it and said, "Why on earth isn't this the title?" And um, so I, I made it the title. And um, I've been telling everybody that that I had this this you know parallel where there were six characters and six of the vital phenomena, and it, it's all part of the grand plan, but it, it was uh, kind of coincidental. <laughs> yeah, I'm just curious about your history as a storyteller. Uh, I, I'm wondering if when you used to hang out here as a kid, uh, were you a storytelling kid or did that come later? And are you, do you feel like you're a person who has stories that have to come out or just, I'm just curious about what your storytelling uh, record yeah. is. Yeah, I, um, I, I don't think um, I'm naturally a, a storyteller. I, I, I'm generally pretty quiet, um, but I do have um, a, a pretty amazing group of friends that, that I, I went through elementary and high school with, um, who are sort of natural raconteurs and and um, sort of, of I'm talking about you, <laughs> um, who 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 just just naturally. Um, Sort of made made my life filled with with absurdities and and um, <laughs> frustrations and really just made my adolescence miserable. But <laughs> but luckily, as an adult, I was able to 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 channel some of that um, more productively. Um, but uh, but no, I th I think that that for me, um, stories have always been um, a, a, a written thing. I, I've I've enjoyed novels and and. Uh, literature has always been the way I understand the world. Um, the, the, if I want to understand um, a different place, um, a different idea, it's usually a novel. Um, it'll usually be fiction that, that does that for me more than um, anything else, really. I think that, that books can be tunnels um, into the psyches and, and souls of, of people that we, we would never meet in, in our day-to-day -day lives. And so, um, so the writing in general sort of came from, from that impulse, from the love of, of reading, um, as I think is, is probably the case with, um, with other writers as well. Thank you. Um, I think I'm probably the father of one of those friends of yours. Uh, <laughs> but um, as, this was just such a, a fantastic uh, novel. And as great as the um, story is, there's a, a fantastic amount of uh, history here. And I'm just curious, um, you must have given a lot of thought to devoting so much of um, your efforts to exploring the, the history of the North Caucasus, about which Americans, I dare say, know next to nothing, um, and uh, up to events in Boston recently. and and. Uh, Delving into that, you, there must have been some some hesitation whether uh, Americans were really ready for a novel set in the North Caucasus and and all of this history and characters there as wonderful as the story is. And I'm just wondering what your thought processes were to to place a, such a, a beautiful story in in an area that Americans would know nothing about. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, well, I, I, I came to, to the project knowing that um, chances are uh, the reader would would know would have no contextual information um, about the region, and um, at, at the same time, I think we go to literature and, and fiction for different reasons than we go to history books, 
And I'm not sure anything can kill the magic of fiction quite so quickly as the sense that you're being given a history lesson. Um, so, so it was definitely sort of a, a tightrope you had, uh, uh, I had to walk. On, on the one hand, you need to ground the story in reality and make sure that that reality um, and, and its background is, is understandable um, in order to make, to make the characters and, and their world believable, but, but you, don't want, um, you don't want to turn it into a Wikipedia entry. Um, so, so this character Kassan was, was really one of the, um, the, the keys in order to, to find that balance. Um, because he, he's a historian, he sort of devoted his life to, um, to preserving the, uh, the history of, of his people that, that the rest of the world seemed, uh, determined to forget. And, um, this series of, of drafts he, he, he composes, um, of his, of his book, um, every time a new, um, a new general secretary comes into power in Moscow. He has to go back and and realign things to um, conform with with their interpretation of Lenin Marxism. And so it was through the the story of his attempts to to write and publish this book more than the any information in the book itself that actually um, sort of provides some of of that context. And in terms of 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 um, of people of Americans being. Um, ready or, or, or willing to, to read a, a book about Chechnya. That was um, sort of a question I had maybe in the back of my mind. I didn't think that um, many people would, to be honest. It's, it's set uh, on the other side of the world. There's no Americans in the book. Um, everybody has a foreign sounding name. Um, but for me, that was part of, of why I felt um, it was an important thing to do, that, that the very fact that, um, that I didn't know it, anything about Chechnya, the fact that, that I couldn't find a novel um, about it seemed all reasons um, to write the book rather than reasons not to write it. Hi. Um, I just awestruck at how brilliant you must be to have put all of this together and at the same time to be so accessible and down to earth and make it all seem somehow ah uh, breezy. So, and I think you must be a wonderful teacher. I want to compliment you on the whole way that you have presented this. My question actually is about humor, because you seem to be a very humorous person and a person who has a very easy sense of humor, and that comes out in the book. And so I'm wondering how you see humor playing a part in a deeply serious book, and in addition, if you ever could see yourself writing something that is basically humorous. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, that in novels as in life, you need to play both ends of the keyboard. That a novel that's just gloom and doom, um, not only is it, is it difficult reading, but it doesn't feel accurate to reality, um, at least not to my understanding of, of existence. I think that, that um, even in very dark moments, there, there, there's humor. Uh, when I visited Chechnya, People were constantly cracking jokes. Um, they were usually at my expense, but <laughs> but that was okay. Um, and and I, I think that that yeah that that to for a book to to have that sort of full range of life, you need to have um, um, all of the notes there, both both the highs and the lows. And there, there's a novel um, in particular that that I read. Um, around the time I was beginning to write this called uh, City of Thieves by David Benioff, which some of you probably have read. And that's set in this uh, Siege of Leningrad. And um, in terms of historical tragedies, uh, there's little that can really compare with, with the Siege of Leningrad. And yet that book is, is sort of brimming with, with um, pathos and, and, and humor and joy and love. And, um, and it, does, it does that without ever um, diminishing the suffering of, of that era. If anything, um, those, th those sort of exuberant moments only counterpoint and, and underscore um, the, the underlying tragedies that, that were occurring then. And I, I tried to take a similar tack um, in this novel, where I think that, um, that humor, not only is it, is it something that, um, that I think is, is integral just to the way I see the world, but I think that as a reader, it can be instantly disarming. Um, you know, there's nothing that makes you sympathetic towards a character um, like a little humor. And uh, I, I'm actually working on a project that is, um, th that is uh, more, more humorous. Um, so. <laughs> uh, well, 
Well, apropos of that, uh, congratulations on the fact that the New York Times compares you to Joseph Heller. Thank you. Um, but on the previous question about the history of Chechnya, um, and you yourself mentioned that at the beginning you knew not, nothing about the place. I wonder, could you take us through the process by which you sort of immersed yourself enough in that history to be able to, you know, write uh, write about it like you did? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it began with uh, with a book called A Small Corner of Hell by uh, the journalist Anna Politkovskaya. And that's a book that's, I mean, it's one of the grimmest books you'll ever read. But at the same time, there is um, this dark humor that's that's running throughout it um, in a way that's that's very peculiar and really unlike anything I've read. Um, and from there, uh, it was it was really finding books about um, on the ground books about everyday people. There are um, libraries full of of academic and and um, uh, and 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 a academic papers and and uh, sort of high-minded historical books about presidents and generals and policies and facts and figures, and those um, were were certainly illuminating for, for background information, but um, what I was most interested in is, is the experience of, of everyday people, and that um, required going to journalists who had actually been there. Um, there was one in particular, um, he, he wasn't a journalist, but he, he was a surgeon named uh, Kassan Baev, and he um, was a, uh, a cosmetic surgeon um, in Chechnya, and he went to, to medical school. He was too poor to afford a place, afford a place to live, and so he slept in a train station while he was going to medical school. And uh, he came back and, and decided that cosmetic surgery was going to be the most, um, uh, the, the, the most lucrative pr profession he could get into. So he started mainly doing, um, doing nose jobs. And um, he uh, found himself suddenly in this situation where he was the only person with uh, surgical skills um, in this large region of Chechnya. And he... Um, he sort of had to make do with with what he had, and at, at different points in the wars, he was uh, he was hunted down by both sides of of the war for treating um, treating patients, irregardless of their um, of their military affiliation. Um, and so it was it was stories like the like those that that really um, uh, galvanized my interest, and um, and from there it was it was you know looking at the sources in those books and and so on and so forth until finally um, I was able to go to Chechnya at long last. Uh, what, what strikes one about the war in Chechnya, it's almost two decades now, is its ferocity and the tenacity of the rebels. And I wonder from your experience with, with Chechens and being in Chechnya, if you could go in some detail on, on sort of the mind that has impelled Chechens for two decades now to fight the Russians with such ferocity. Is it primarily nationalism? Is it primarily Islamic? beliefs, or, or what is it that keeps the Chechens going out, as you say in the book, into the forest to fight the Russians? Yeah, it's, uh, well, the war, uh, most recently, it, it began in 1994 um, as an independence um, movement, but it, it's really been going on um, uh, below the surface at times and flaring up for over 300 years. It began when uh, the, the Russian Empire um, expanded into the northern Caucasus, and ever since then, it's been a question of of territorial sovereignty o about who has um, legitimate ownership over this over this region, um, and and the 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 centers of of gravity have shifted throughout. There was a, a period in the um, 18th century in which a man named Imam Shamil um, led the uh, Led a 25-year rebellion, and he was a, a really remarkable figure. He um, he he only had a, a couple hundred to a couple thousand troops, but he was able to to keep um, the entire Russian army sort of uh, on their toes for this two or three decade long period. And he would um, he would fit his horses with uh, with horseshoes that were backwards, so that uh, when the Russian troops were searching for them, they would all go <laughs> in the in the wrong direction. And he's, he had this sort of entire um, uh, uh, repertoire of, of, these, of these little tricks that he would pull <laughs> on them. Um, in, in another life, he would have been, you know, a great prankster. Um, um, and he, uh, he actually has this sort of almost um, 
uh, Shakespearean story himself, his youngest son was, or excuse me, his, his firstborn son um, was uh, taken by, by the Russians when he was eight years old and was raised in um, the, the Tsar's court in St. Petersburg. And he forgot uh, how to speak Chechen. He became the Tsar's godson. Um, he ended up serving in the very army his father was, was fighting. And he, um, the, the son had uh, fallen in love with a princess um, during all this time. And so Imam Shamil, the father, kidnapped the princess. And he, um, he said that he would only trade back the princess, the woman that, that his son loved, if his son would come back. And so the son, after 25 some years of, of, of living in, in St. Petersburg, um, is, is, is traded for the love of his life and uh, returns to Chechnya not knowing how to speak the language, um, hating everybody there, um, and dying shortly thereafter. Um, but but, but so, so, so the, the, the conflict um, has been going on for a long time. Um, the, the novel is, is, as I've said, much more, um, while, while that's the backdrop, it's much more about um, these characters who are trying to, to, um, to recover what they've lost and to preserve what they, they still have. When you, when you said you went back a year ago to check your facts, I'm very curious about what you had to adjust, add, or subtract. Yeah. Um, so w when, when I was writing the book, I'd, I'd, uh, I was hoping to go to Chechnya, but when I started, it was still a, um, a zone of counterterrorism operation, which meant that the borders were sealed, nobody could go in or out. Um, and I was able to finally go back or uh, visit last year. I found, um, I found the, uh, the very first uh, travel agent in Chechnya. And um, uh, I found her on, on Twitter. And she, <laughs> she, uh, she has a, uh, a website. And it's very professional looking in Russian. But when you put it through Google Translate to get to English, it becomes a website that sells knockoff prescription drugs. Um, <laughs> So I, I arrived there. I mean, I wrote my will out before I went. I was half certain I wasn't coming back. Um, uh, but she, she was lovely, and, and she, she, she took me all around. Um, and, and there were, yeah, there were, there were certainly uh, 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 things here and there that I had to tweak. For instance, in, in a previous draft of, of the book, there's a scene that's uh, set on an escalator. And um, when, uh, when I went, the, the scene is set in 2004. And when I, uh, when I went, uh, Elena, this, this travel agent, um, she took me to the very first escalator to be built in Chechnya, and that was built in 2007. And it was a very big deal. Um, people brought their kids from all over Chechnya to play on this escalator. And it was, I mean, it was one of the, 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 uh, the tour I was taking was called The Seven Wonders of Chechnya. <laughs> and, and this was one of the wonders. <laughs> um, um, but, uh, but, but yeah, and also just, the, you know, there's certain... Um, certain things that you just, uh, that no amount of research will really tell you, you know, the feeling of, of the humidity there, um, uh, the, uh, the, the smell of the food, the, um, the graffiti on the wall. Um, one thing that, that I hadn't found in, um, in anything I'd read was the prevalence of above ground gas pipes so that um, some streets sort of look like these mazes of, of, of um, gas pipes. Um, and, and, and a variety of things on, on, along those lines, but nothing really that, um, that substantially changed the, the overall architecture of the book. Um, Hal, excuse me, I just have to say, as your first grade teacher, I... <laughs> I couldn't be prouder. I was also 16 when I taught him. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm still teaching, and I, you know, I'm now teaching second grade, and um, <laughs> I learned my short vowels and long vowels. And I was telling my children, you know, you try as a teacher to encourage the children to say, you really can grow up and be whomever you like. And I said, everyone has their dreams and their goals. And I said, but you have to work at it. And I brought in the article from the Washington Post the other day to show them. And I said, boys and girls, I had him when he was in first grade, and I said, you know, it can happen to you. And I said, just like Tommy DePaulo, he was a famous author of children. He was five years old when he had his dream and his goal. So they had three questions, if you don't mind, for me to bring back to them tomorrow. Um, one, did you enjoy learning to read? And uh, 
How much, and also, uh, we do a lot of journal writing, as you might remember, we did that. And do you think any of that kind of helped you, or in your... <laughs> <laughs> you know how you have to respond, Hal. <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to say that I could have written this without knowing how to read, but, <laughs> but it would have been tough. <laughs> And they were very taken by the fact that it's uh, 386 pages or something, because I try to encourage them to read, you know, a chapter book that maybe is 60 pages, and they're like shocked. And and when they you get them to try to write um, a story, you know, they think, "quote I'm done," you know, in you know a half hour. So they wanted. I said, "No, boys and girls, it really takes a long time." So they were wondering, "Well, how much time did you did you take? So many hours a day, or?" How many weeks or months did this all take you, the process? Yeah, um, I, I wrote uh, four or five drafts of it. Um, and each time I would finish one, I would, I would print it out and start retyping from the first sentence. Um, for, for me, uh, the, the act of, of retyping um, sort of taps into whatever creative well the, um, the sentences first emerged from. And so, uh, so it's sort of a, a time-intensive um, way to to revise, but I think that that once you're in the sentence again and sort of living in its rhythms, um, you're able to to do much more, and and the book can change organically from the inside rather than having um, sort of exterior revisions um, imposed upon it. Um, and so yeah, uh, it it probably took maybe three years in total um, to do okay. to do that number. Um, I'll share that with them. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a little overwhelmed. I, I was at the museum this morning. Uh, they had a, a, a rededication for fallen journalists. And on the way back to Bethesda, I heard your interview and decided to come here tonight. Um, my, my, my daughter, Cynthia Elbam, was a journalist uh, for the to Times magazine, Times, and she... Um, she was killed in the beginning of the first war in 1994, December 22nd. And at that time, it, the square was named after her. She was considered a hero and everything. And, and not much was known about Chechnya back then. I mean, you know, when I got the call from the State Department, I, I didn't know what they were talking about. But what I'm asking you, did you research back into 1994 and did you, did you come across that at all? I know it's not named after her anymore, and they don't even consider her. I know, like a few years ago, there was an article Chris Shivers wrote it from the New York Times uh, about um, in Grozny. She was killed in Grozny. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a for the journalists who died. They had a ceremony. They have a monument, and she was left off that list. Mm -hmm. And it, you know. I'm just wondering, have you, did you come across anything? I, I, I went to that monument when I was there, um, and, and I, it deeply saddens me to hear that, that she was left off of that. Um, a, a number of, of journalists have, have lost their lives um, during, during the wars, and it's, it's been one of the, the real tragedies. Um, Anna Politkovskaya is sort of the one that, that, um, that, that people speak of um, most most frequently because her assassination was so so public and um, so um, so so notorious. But but um, but there there has been been dozens that have died, and it's um, it's one of the the real um, the, the real atrocities of the war are, are these people who who have gone there simply to tell um, to tell the stories, to simply say what's happening and. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She was killed by a bomb. You know, they had been bombing at night, and then the journalists would go out and, during the morning. And the first morning, she was killed in the square with 20 other people. So, but I, I just, this is, thank you. This, this is, I don't know what you would call it, serendipity or something. We could just go and have this all happen. Anyway, thank you. I just uh, was recalling a book that I have loved uh, called The Great Game. And, you know, the Russians w were having great conflicts with the whole Central Asia and the Caucasus. Uh, 
did Chechnya ever get integrated into the Soviet system or it was always in conflict? Yeah, that's um, The Great Game is, is an incredible book. Um, he's written a couple of... Uh, uh, Coker Co or P Peter? I Peter. That guy, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> no, no, he's, he's a, a wonderful writer. Um, Chechnya was, was um, uh, subsumed into the Soviet Union, and it was a um, semi-autonomous republic within it. Um, in 1944, Stalin... Um, Stalin was was fearful that that the Chechens would become collaborators with the um, the invading Nazi forces, which uh, had their eyes on Grozny and and beyond that the Baku oil fields, and um, and he deported all of uh, the entire population of Chechnya to Kazakhstan and, and Kyrgyzstan and Siberia, and um, and they were very much part of the the Soviet Empire, and it was when they. Um, they declared freedom in 1994 amid its its dissolution that that uh, sparked the uh, the first of these these horrific wars.